Florian has more than seven years of experience in data science. In 2014, he received his PhD in computer science from the Technical University of Munich, after which he joined the University of Toronto as a postdoctoral fellow. During Florian's academic career, his focus was on developing and implementing top-notch custom machine learning solutions. Prior to joining the BMO, Florian worked as a researcher at Loyalty One's Innovation Lab, where he investigated novel applications of deep learning on Canada's largest retail data set with the goal to improve your shopping experience. Florian's goal as a member of the BMO Data Cognition Team is to use his acquired ML expertise to deliver the best possible machine learning solutions to a specific problem. In his free time, Florian actively participates in the Toronto AI environment, like ours. He gives uh, lots of speeches. That's how I, uh, I got to know him. And he explores uh, new ML technologies and their applications. The title of the talk is Using AI to re Reduce Food Waste. I was personally amazed to hear uh, from the description of his talk that half of the food that's produced in Canada goes to waste, which is, you can imagine that we can feed another 30 million people with that food. So that's a lot of food. How can we leverage current AI technologies to tackle this problem? We'll find out from his speech, I guess. So I invite Florian. Oh, you're already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this uh, introduction. If not, it was a bit delayed, but however. <laughs> um, let's continue. So I want everybody to raise their hand, OK? Everybody, hands up, hands up. OK, if you say I cook at most once a month at home, I want to lower your, I want you to put your hand down. If I say, OK, I cook at most once a week, I want to put your hand, you want to put your hand down. So a good chunk of people that cook more than once a week at home. And at least this is why an issue I had many times is like, oh, you cook and sometimes you forget and life happens. And then you have this kind of moldy vegetable or fruit in your fridge and uh, off it goes to the garbage bin. So I was thinking, you know what? A lot of families must also struggle with that. And I think, how can I use AI to make this problem go away? So today, I'm going to tell you a bit, how did we get here? So what was the progress and what's the current situation? And I'm going to tell you a little bit what's the problem I chose to focus on. Because there are so many problems with food waste, from going to optimizing the production chain to like reducing food waste at home and so on, and reducing food waste in restaurants. Then I will motivate the solution I suggested, I built a small proof of concept, what you can build and do to improve the situation. And then I'm going to tell a little bit, okay, what's going to be the future steps of it. So a little bit about myself as well, Drogas already touched on it. So I have 10 years of machine learning experience if I count my undergrad and I worked in many fields, mostly life science, where I did machine learning on genomics and protein, protein interactions. And then I had enough life science in my life. So I said, OK, I need to do something that can, can generate real tangible value. And I thought, OK, I'm going to do a bit more marketing, big data, and then I'm now in, in finance. And how did we get here? So if you look over the course of 100 years, we saw a, an increase in our productivity. And this is mostly due to innovations in technology. And through this innovation, we have seen an improvement in life quality on a global scale, which has never been seen before. And so many issues that were commonplace 100 years ago are nowadays just a faint memory. So the, the issue I'm going to talk mostly about is like famine and food production. So we increase our food production. There are no more people don't starve to death. There are still pockets on this planet where people have problem, where there is food insecurity, but it's no longer at the scale as it was 100 years ago. And this in increase is tremendous. But as we see this advancement, it comes with a cost. And one big topic, which is I think also very important for everyone, is like how does our 
work and our production affects the environment and the climate. And another point I want to talk about here is waste. I think it's a problem, it's close to me, and it's close to everyone, and it's kind of linked to everything. Right? Say, if I waste food, I don't only waste the food or the money it cost me, I also waste all the labor that went into producing the food, all the water that went into producing food, and all the carbon necessary to produce the food. So it is kind of all linked together. And these are some numbers to give you a perspective. These are like the global statistics for food waste. And globally, 33% of food is wasted. So this is produced and never used. And it totals to almost a trillion dollar damage annually. And the numbers are projected to be like 1.5 trillion dollar within uh, 10 to 15 years. And <coughs> sorry. To give you a little bit of numbers, 25% of the food we waste could feed almost a billion people. It's like one-seventh of the global population. And, and when people think about food scarcity and food insecurity, they often imagine like an underdeveloped, faraway country. But even here in Canada, one in eight households are also food insecure. So this is a problem that is pretty much universal in every country in the world. So saying, thinking that there are families here in Toronto have problems providing food, having to understand that, oh, in Canada, more than 50% of food is wasted, is kind of a shame. So if we just simply redistribute this food, we can reduce it. And another way we can think of it is, so if we take all this food waste and we say, what would be the carbon impact of it? it would be roughly 25% of all the cars on the road. So you can think one ton of food waste is, pretty mu is equivalent to one car on the street. And if Canada has 22 million tons of food waste annually, it would be the equivalent of 22 million cars on the street. And another way to see it is like, okay, let's say we look at the percentage global greenhouse emissions per country. China is one of the biggest producer, but this has many reasons because it's a big country and also a lot of the global manufacturing is happening there in China. If you would look at the same numbers but per capita, then China would do consider better, but this is not the point of this plot. I want to tell, what I want to tell you is if you look at food waste, food waste would be, if food waste would be a country, it would be the third largest contributor to CO2 emissions just behind the USA. And it makes a total of almost 7% of global carbon emissions. As Drogas mentioned, more than half of all Canadian produced food is wasted, which totals to an annual loss of $27 billion. And it's 2.2 million tons of waste every year. And where does this waste originate? And we see a majority of the food waste actually comes from household. People are in their household, they buy groceries, the groceries expire, they get bad, and the people throw it away. There's also a considerable amount of food involved in the processing and distribution, which includes like retail, farming, and processing. And it's just a small part of food that's wasted in, in restaurants. And there was recent, uh, recently a Toronto startup that built kind of an IoT device, which kind of inspired what I was building. So they were checking what restaurants are throwing away into the garbage bin and to let the restaurant know, okay, this type of site or this type of food, people tend to throw away. So you can put less on the plate just to reduce their food waste in restaurants. So, Inspired by this, I set out and thought, okay, what can I build to help in households? Because I see it's the biggest sector where people produce food. So if I can make a solution that can target that sector, so what kind of household device can I build or design that helps people to reduce their food waste at home? And of course, I'm a technology person and I'm very interested in technology and machine learning solutions and I do a lot of coding and work. 
in that field. So naturally, I was tendencing to finding a technology-based solution on that problem. <clears throat> and the way I think of it is, if you follow the machine learning development in the last few years, is that machine learning achieved superhuman performance in object detection and in computer vision, in identifying objects and classifying images. I thought, okay, how can I use this technology to improve and help people? And the way I think of it is, I can use like automatic inventory system for your fridge. So the idea is you take or you put something in the fridge, the, the, the device will tell you, okay, you have that in the fridge. It's like so many times, so many days since you have moved that item from the fridge. Or um, I know, we know a roughly expectation how long things stay fresh. So I can give people push notifications saying, okay, you have this and your fridge is gonna expire soon. Or if things expire frequently, you can let people know, okay, you put this in the fridge and last four times you bought it, it expired. I'll let people know, okay, maybe you should be more considerate and think, okay, keep track of this item. And the technology solution here I propose is rather straightforward. So you have your fridge and you have some kind of edge device. Here I have a Raspberry Pi with a camera and I'm gonna run a run uh, object detection machine learning algorithm on it for now. And once it get, get us all the data, it's gonna send up to Firebase. And if you Firebase, you're gonna track the data back to your phone and it keeps you, help you keep track of, the solu of your fridge content. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and this is more like a proof concept work that was done. And later you will see that uh, Raspberry Pi is not really capable of running this kind of image detection algorithms really on, on the device. But what people normally do, they run it on AWS, they run it on the cloud, and then they send the image to the cloud, do the machine learning back and send the image back. Because if you run it on Raspberry Pi, the amount of images you can classify per second is gonna be maybe one every five or 10 seconds. However, if you run it on a cloud, you have your 11 milliseconds latency, depending how fast your connection is to the Sage server. If you do, if you do WebSocket, you can improve it. And then the runtime on the server, which is like, again, in the millisecond space. So you can get like a 100 fold uh, speed up. Um, so to keep, take, put you up to speed, what is happening in the image field is that in 20, since 2011, huge improvements happened in the in it, and what you here see is the error rate. <coughs> so the error for the best performance met method in the ImageNet competition, and all the way to the right, you see the humans perform human performance. And we see around 2014, 2016, we reached kind of human level performance, and this was Google's ImageNet, which achieved human level performance or superhuman level performance. And since then, a lot of people, it was back then state of the art for image classification. I think right now is some other model is it, but it's still very good and it's public available. So anyone can get the weights, you can get the pre-trained model and you can run it for your image classification problem. And what was the technology? What was the core technology that helped people to achieve this performance, to achieve these results? So convolutional let or convolutional layer, there have been around for quite some time. They've been already around in the 80s. But the recent technology advances allowed you to apply these filter, these convolutional filters to large amount of images, to big images. And what they do, we're gonna see later a more detailed description of it. And what they do is basically they take the small square here and then apply a filter on it. And here each of these layers would be a filter. And this filter is just something like, kind of like a weight matrix multiplication. And each different filter tries diff to capture different aspects of the image. Some tries to capture edges, some tries to capture like writing, some tries to capture like faces or nose or whatever. And after applying this filter to each spot, so it's kind of the square, it zooms through the image and then creates the big matrix and then from this big matrix, it's called like a pooling. So you do the pooling to kind of remove a little bit of the spatial information to make it not overfit the belly. And it takes the small element and takes just the max value. Like there are different types of pooling, like minimum pooling, max pooling, average, average pooling. And depending on the pooling, 
layer you use, you just perform the uh, appropriate function to that segment of this matrix and you put it to one value. And in the image classification layers, what they do, they do this kind of convolution pooling layer. They just do it repeatedly over and over and over again. And they also do it in parallel, where they take one image and I don't run like one of these boxes, I run like three or two of these boxes at the same time. So basically I find two different positions in the image and their relationship to those two positions. And as you see, the space, the feature space, like you can consider the image as a, like a feature. Say I have a 200 times 300 image, I have three colors, so it would be like a two times three, 200 times 300 times three like feature dimension space. And it shrinks it down smaller, smaller. And in the very end, you kind of flatten all these values to, long, to basically one long vector and you apply multiple dense layers behind of it. And then you do, because ImageNet, say it has over, one point, over a million images and 20,000 classes, and norm, what people do, they do a softmax. So the softmax basically gives you a probability for every class, so how confident is the layer that it's this class or that class. And that's how the convolution layer with the, with the pooling kind of works. So, Think if this is the or, oops, if this is the original image, kind of you run the convolution and then you apply a pooling and then you kind of shrink the image and you condense the information. And this is the inception architecture. And <coughs> the red layers are, are the dense layers, the green layers are some different layers. Softmax, like these are different, oh, it's not always the same layer, it's just miscellaneous layer. And the uh, yellow layer is the softmax, so you see here it comes the input, and it makes three different softmax output predictions, and then it just back propagates the error from each. And the blue one, these are the convolutional layers. So you see there's a lot of layers, and a lot of convolutions, and a lot of parameters, and it takes a lot of computational power to train this network. However, if you take the pre-trained network and you have it, you can easily just run it locally yourself. And even better, what you can do is, at the very end, you have your dense layers. And the, the way you do it is you can retrain the weights of the dense layers. Called, this method is called transfer learning. This allows to take the whole engine and just kind of switch out a small part and then it does something different, which is like it can be retrained on certain image problems that you personally care a lot about. And there's like some, some slide is missing, sorry. So the way I will build it is like I have a camera, so I don't have like a static image. So there's something happening, there's some moving, move, moving element. I have like a video feed. And what you want to do, you want to do keep track of the object and you want to recognize and find all the objects and it's like a bit of different problem because maybe there will be many different objects in the image in it. And what people develop is called YOLO, is called, which is short for you, you look only once. And it's a real-time object detection algorithm and it's the version three that came out recently. It's, the cur it's one of the state-of-the-art method. Facebook recently released detector, which is also uh, a considerable, which you can also use. And how does it work? You take the image and it splits the image into a S by S grid of cells. And then for each cell, it will predict the class. <coughs> and the next step, for each cell, it will predict like a point, an X and a Y value. And this is the expected corner of the bounding box. So you see each cell, you can have a possible end, a possible corner of the bounding box. And what you hear you see is for each possible bounding box, you can accumulate, you can calculate the total confidence of all your predictions. And what you see here is the thickness. The thickness you see here is the confidence of, all of each individual bounding box. And what you do, you have some threshold and you just take the most confident one and then you're left with, oh, this is a dog and a bicycle and a van in the back. This is the final prediction. So this is my, my small fridge at home. 
and this is going to run on a Raspberry Pi. And it's going to be very modest, but you're going to see it. So I'm going to put some bananas into my fridge. They're already not that fresh. Better eat them today. <laughs> and you see, it kind of keeps track of them. And then the end, it believes they're hot dog. So <laughs> that's, that's a trick that can only happen in machine learning, from bananas to hot dogs. So <clears throat> what happened here is I just took the YOLO network out of the box as it is. And it's trained on 20,000 classes, right? And then we'll try to predict all kinds of things, like a keyboard or whatever. And normally what I should do, but I didn't have time to get around with it, you can retrain the network, say I just take all the grocery data that's available or the food data that's available, and then retrain on those. And then I put like kind of like an out class group in there. And then I wouldn't have the problem. It's going to predict all kinds of random stuff. And so what's the next step after this, besides what I just said? <laughs> so once I can keep track of your, say, daily fridge inventory, what I can do is tell people, keep people informed about, OK, what's the impact of your groceries? What's, what's really happening here besides just the price? And tell people and inform people so they can make a conscious choice how their day-to-day -day behavior will impact the environment. Because as you can see, that lamb and beef has a considerably bigger impact on the environment. Let's say here it's just kilogram CO2 per, per kilogram meat than, say, pork, chicken, or the other ones. But this is just one dimension. You're looking at it. Because beyond just the carbon production, it's also like how much la land does it take to grow certain specific groceries and how much water does it take. And then you can s build a metric out of it and say, OK, if you want to have these groceries there, better make sure you, you, you don't waste them, because wasting them will have a considerable worse impact on the environment. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay, we'll start this side. Okay. It's a very uh, nice presentation. From my own experience, I know that most of the food that is weighed is actually in containers, and your camera would be totally useless without uh, if the food is, is not visible. So have you have a complementary solution, barcoding the containers maybe or something? Yeah, I was thinking about like putting QR codes on your container, and then when you put it inside the fridge, you either open the container and have some kind of food classification, whatever. And then you put the lid back on and it checks the QR code. Like one way, easy way would be just barcoding the containers. Yeah, that's the ad hoc solution I was thinking of as well. So my question is more around the user-centeredness of this and who you're actually trying to serve. Uh, the last guy who just asked a question proposed a solution that to me addresses the needs of, for example, parents who might freeze a number of things and don't remember what they froze and when it's going to go bad. But your solution strikes me that the real consumer for this might not be the consumers themselves, but those who want to surveil populations to find out what's in their fridge, which includes insurance companies and others. So can you tell me how you've, what you've done to consider who you were serving and see whether that solution actually serves them or if it serves other people who might have other needs? Well, the bottom line is who, who do you give access to your data? Who is going to be in control of your own data, right? If you say, I want to use the service to better keep track of what do automatic fridge inventory, and then I want to create my own shopping list. It's like I select some dishes, and then I can automatically give you your shopping list. Then automatically, I'm going to serve the direct consumer of it, like the family who is behind it. And the way I think the product is aiming to is aiming for those families. 
So I would not definitely go and go around and say, okay, how can I sell this data or this individual personalized data to the highest bidder, either insurance companies. If I want to roll it out in the European Union, even getting this private data and give it to insurance companies is not even possible anymore because it would be in violation of GDPR. Hi, I have a question regarding your percentage. You said that 47% we waste the food, uh, retailers only 10. I was surprised about these numbers. Please uh, explain how you calculated the sample size, the country, the globe. I don't know. Howdy. Thank you. <laughs> So the number was from 33% global food waste. And this was done by the U United Nations. They did a survey on this, and this is where I got the number. I don't know all these details uh, by hand in my head. Yeah. One more. <coughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering because uh, Google has now a search option where you can take a picture of an image and then it searches its database. So thinking about the whole container issue, would that be something that you can, ac is that something that you can access or is that some, some sort of technology that's available in terms of managing that type of inventory? Definitely something you can think of. Uh, when he mentioned container, what the, when I was thinking about containers, what people have their own custom Tupper box. Not really. I was not thinking you have like some frozen product. And yeah, definitely you can do the Google search, but I don't know how well the API is for it. But Google does have an image classification service, which you just pay per image, which you classify. Uh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. I just uh, have a question. Uh, you mentioned the, the uh, uh, convolution. Uh, yeah. so, so, so my question is about the convolution uh, because uh, in the uh, um, uh, pr uh, signal processing domain, we also use uh, convolution. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in the time domain, yeah. uh, if we uh, perform a convolution, that uh, the uh, output signal uh, will be uh, with the length of uh, the signal length plus the filter length minus one, right? So, but in the image, um, the 2D uh, conv uh, convolution, it seems that the filter cannot be uh, beyond the boundary of the image. So that means the uh, length of the output should be uh, the signal length minus uh, uh, si uh, filter length, that means M minus n. So my question is uh, why into uh, different domain in pr uh, signal processing uh, the filter can go beyond the uh, signal? Oh, That's my question. So mm, Yeah, so what people do is for images they just do fill the border with zero. That's what they do. You can do zero padding around the image and then you just run over the zeros. I guess this was your question, right? Yeah, that's it. You don't, you don't have to do it. This is what people do most of the time. So they can capture more of the image. It's not mandatory. So what they do is say you have three by three filter, which you play through the image. People do two pixel of padding. So the image after the max pooling is like one dimension smaller. And you don't have to do it. It's what people do. So you can also do no padding, but then your image will shrink faster. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting.